Thank you guys for being here for the Nutrition Educators Training. We really appreciate it. Our first speaker for the day is Ms. Whitney Reist. She comes to us from Columbia, Missouri. She is a registered dietitian with professional training from Le Cordon Bleu Institute of Culinary Arts. Her varied and ever-changing experience as a dietitian has included work as a clinical dietitian in the outpatient oncology setting, personal chef services to private clients, private practice nutrition consulting, and work as a culinary dietitian in the retail setting. Uh, she also has a food and lifestyle blog, Sweet Cayenne. So today, Whitney's presentation is Beef, a Lean, Mean, Fueling Machine. So we'll go ahead and welcome uh, Whitney to the stage. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to talk with you about beef nutrition and some of the latest research and condense it in a way that's easy for you to remember and relate to consumers. Um, like Margot said, I am a personal chef and a food and lifestyle blogger. I currently work for the University of Missouri Hospital in the outpatient setting, and I started working for the Missouri Beef Industry Council this past June. And pictured in this slide is one of my favorite healthy lean beef recipes. This is a flat iron steak with a maple bourbon espresso sauce that I had the pleasure of trying on a beef tour on the pasture to plate tour with Mark. And then it was so good that I had to go home and recreate it for myself. So that is my favorite beef recipe. Uh, just an overview of what we're gonna do today. We're gonna examine the latest research relating to lean beef as part of a heart healthy diet. Um, we're gonna break down the recent report by the World Health Organization um, and show how beef can be fit into a cancer prevention lifestyle. And then we're gonna look at beef's role as a high quality protein source that promotes optimal synthesis of lean body mass. And then at the end, we're gonna summarize all of that into key messages that you can take away from today and easily remember and share with consumers. So feel free to uh, ask questions along the way. If not, write them down and we can save them for the end, all right? Uh, how can dietitians and health professionals be confident in working with the beef industry? Well, since I started my involvement uh, with the Missouri Beef Council in June, I've just been so impressed at how everyone I've met in the industry, whether they be in the packaging section or the farmers that raise the, the cows and the calf cattle operation, and even people that work at headquarters, I've just been so impressed with how transparent they are with consumers about how beef is raised and produced. And every question I've had for them, they've backed it up with science and facts. And if they haven't known the answers, they go back and research and get back to me. So I know that I, I can be confident in their claims and what they say because of their transparency and the commitment to supporting claims with science and research. First of all, we're going to talk about lean beef. I titled this presentation, Beef, a Lean Mean Fueling Machine. So we'll start the lean discussion first. And I'd like to just kind of review some things that consumers are saying about beef with regards to heart health. I work in the outpatient setting, so a lot of times my clients will say, well, I can't eat beef because it's too high in fat, and eating beef is bad for heart health. I've got high cholesterol and if I eat beef, it will make it even higher. That's what I hear a lot. How many of you have heard that before? <laughs> yeah. Well, the fact is there's actually today in this day and age, there's over 38 cuts of beef that are available at the retail level that meet the Food and Drug Administration specifications for lean. Now, how many of you know what the FDA considers to be lean as far as meat goes or chicken or poultry. Does anybody know? So per three, out, three and a half ounce serving of beef, it's considered lean if it has less than 10 grams of fat, less than four and a half grams of saturated fat, and less than 95 milligrams of cholesterol per serving, okay? So it's got to fall into that range to be considered a lean cut. And in this today, there's over 38 cuts of beef that are, meet that specification. 
Also, more than half of the fatty acids in lean beef guts are monounsaturated fats, which are actually healthy for your heart. And a third of the saturated fat in beef is stearic acid, which studies have shown have a neutral effect on cholesterol levels, okay? And then lastly, if you look at beef and compare it to what Americans actually eat, beef only counts for 10% of the saturated fat in the average American diet. It's what we serve with beef that can make it really high in fat and bad for our hearts. Things like cream sauces and butter and cheese and bacon and all the stuff we put on top of it. This is a graphic that is available on beefnutrition.org, 29 ways to love lean beef. So it breaks down 29 different cuts of beef that meet the FDA standard for lean and tells you how much fat is in each cut, saturated fat. Um, and like I said, now there's 38 cuts. <laughs> there's more than 29. And that's just thanks to changes in cattle breeding and fat trimming methods. And nowadays, there's a higher demand for lean beef. People are more concerned about heart health, and so they're demanding more high-quality lean cuts. And so if you would like this, just for your own reference, this is available for download on beefnutrition.org. So let's just break down that burger and see how much fat beef actually contributes to an American burger. How many calories do you think would be in this burger? 800, 900, 1,000. All very good guesses. Let's, let's break it down. A typical sesame seed bun has about 220 calories, what you would buy in the store. Let's say if you're at a restaurant, they're probably going to toast that bun on some butter on the griddle. So we'll be conservative and say that they use a teaspoon of butter. That would be 34 calories. Conservative. <laughs> And then the white stuff on the top, you can see that there's mayo on there. We'll be conservative again and say a tablespoon of mayonnaise. That would contribute 57 calories. And then we're going to slap some bacon on there as if we didn't have enough meat. Three slices um, of cooked bacon would contribute 308 calories to the burger. And then all restaurants across the board, unless they advertise, differently, typically use ground chuck, which is 80% lean, 20% fat. And it's also more than the recommended serving of meat you should eat at a meal, which is three to four ounces. A typical restaurant burger is six ounces of ground chuck, which is almost 400 calories. And then they'll typically add two slices of cheese, 139 calories. So we come to a grand total of 1,147 calories in a single meal. And we're not even counting for the fries we probably have on the side, which is another 700 to 800 calories. So as you can see, it's what we're putting on the beef and serving with it that's contributing to the high amounts of fat in the American diet. So how can we build a better burger, a heart healthy burger with lean beef? How many calories do you think are in this burger? 300, 600, 400. Good guesses. So first of all, we're going to start off with a whole wheat slider bun. Okay, this is about a two ounce bun for just under 100 calories. All right. And then to that bun, we're going to toast it in about a teaspoon of olive oil to make it nice and crispy on the outside of the bun. Olive oil is a heart healthy oil. It's going to contribute 40 calories. And then to add a nice creamy texture to the burger without mayonnaise, we're going to use a sixth of an avocado, which has 68 calories and contributes even more heart healthy fats to the meals. Then two slices of tomato for a grand total of three calories. And then for a nice peppery flavor and crunch, we'll do about a fourth cup of arugula for one calorie. That's totally going to break the bank. And then for some more crunch and fiber, we'll add a fourth cup of bean sprouts, kind of do a California style burger for 13 calories. 
And then we're going to use three ounces of lean ground beef, okay? Maybe a 90-10 or a 93-7, whatever you can, the leanest kind you can find at the store for 158 calories, which is about half the calories of the chuck. So we've got a grand total of 379 calories, but still a good source of protein and lots of color. So we gotta change kind of the shift in the way we think about eating beef. Consumers also say, I heard this last week, ground turkey is better for you than ground beef. Every time I make a recipe for my blog with ground beef, I always get a comment, well, I'm just going to make this with ground turkey, and it'll be healthier for me. I get that a lot. But actually, the fact is the nutrient profiles in ground turkey versus ground beef are very similar as far as fat and cholesterol goes. And you can get ground turkey that's really high in fat. There's ground turkey, and then there's lean ground turkey. But in actuality, the beef is more nutrient dense when you're looking at actual vitamins and minerals like iron and B12 and zinc, beef is higher. So it's more nutritionally dense and you're getting more nutrition bang for your calorie buck, okay? They also say, I don't know how to prepare beef in a heart healthy way. This was something I struggled a lot with in college and as a young adult, I was really intimidated to cook cuts of beef like a sirloin steak or even, even an eye of round roast like because it's kind of costly and I was afraid I would overcook it and dry it out and I just wasn't confident in preparing those leaner cuts. Um, but actually there's so many resources that I've learned about in the past year that are provided and funded by the Beef Checkoff that can increase confidence in heart healthy cooking with beef. For example, the Beef Council has created this awesome Heart Healthy Beef Cookbook that's available on Amazon. And then beefitswhatsfordinner.com, they have this really great interactive butcher counter feature of the website. So you can go to the butcher counter and check, I want a heart healthy cut of beef. Then you pick the cut and it will provide recipe and cooking suggestions for that cut of beef. So if you're ever wondering, you know, what cut should I buy to make this type of dish, go to the interactive butcher counter at beefitswhatsfordinner.com. I mentioned a little while ago about beef being very nutrient dense. You get a lot of nutrition bang for your calorie buck. This is a graphic I really li like that's available on beefnutrition.org, beef's big 10. Okay, we have a 10, 10, 10 rule for lean beef. So if you eat a three ounce serving of lean beef, that will be less than 10% of the total calories in a 2000 calorie diet but it will provide more than 10% of the daily value for 10 essential vitamins and minerals, okay? So three ounce serving of beef, less than 10% of your calories, it gives you more than 10% of 10 essential vitamins and minerals. So it's a, a lot of bang for your buck there. Next, I wanna talk about a study that was done um, recently called the BOLD study. Has anyone heard of the BOLD study? This full study is available on beefnutrition.org if you'd like to read it, but it stands for Beef in an Optimal Lean Diet Study, and it was a randomized control trial conducted by Penn State University. And the purpose was to look at a variety of different diets and the amount of lean beef they included and see what the effect of lean beef in a heart healthy diet was on LDL and total cholesterol. And for the study, they chose people who already had moderately high cholesterol to see the effect. Now they divided the people up into four different diets. The first diet was a control group. And these people just consumed an average, quote unquote, healthy American diet that had a higher amount of refined grains, full fat dairy products, oil and butter used in cooking to reflect current dietary habits. The next group was the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension group, otherwise known as the DASH diet. Has anyone heard of the DASH diet? DASH diet is the gold standard heart healthy diet education that we provide for patients in the hospital on a heart healthy diet. It's a very plant-based diet, so you're getting most of your calories from fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, 
and the recommended protein sources on the DASH diet are chicken, turkey, and fish, with less beef and re red meat being included. <coughs> the third group was the bold diet, the beef in an optimal lean diet. And this was very similar to the DASH diet, but instead of recommending chicken or turkey, uh, participants were allowed to have four ounces of lean beef per day to help contribute protein to the meal. And then they had the Bold Plus diet, and these individuals were able to have an even higher uh, protein lean beef intake with 5.4 ounces a day. So we can compare the nutrient profiles of the four diets. As you can see, when you compare the calorie content of the Bold and the Bold Plus with the DASH diet, the calories are virtually equivalent. And then when you look at the saturated fat, it's the same across the board with the diets that included lean beef. But actually the diets that included lean beef were higher in mono and saturated fats, which is a heart healthy fat. So in just five weeks of following these diets, they showed similar reductions in total cholesterol and LDL with the DASH group in the individuals that consumed beef as part of the heart healthy diet. So this study is just part of a growing body of overall evidence that you can consume lean cuts of beef on a daily basis and still lower your cholesterol and avoid increasing your cholesterol. So if you'd like to look at that study in more detail, it's available at beefnutrition.org. Now it's time for the mean part. Now, this is kind of a stretch, but I titled it mean because I feel like beef gets a lot of bad rap in the media. There's a lot of misconceptions from consumers about beef and whether or not it's really healthy. And I'm sure you saw some cartoons, comics like this several months ago when the World Health Organization came out with its report on cancer and what causes cancer. Um, I saw a lot of headlines on my Facebook feed, red meat causes cancer, don't eat beef anymore, and so forth. So that was all caused by this chart right here. The International Agency on Research for Cancer published this graphic that categorizes certain substances based on how likely they are to cause cancer, okay? Now you look in the first group and what's included is smoking, UV radiation, alcohol intake, and processed meat. These are all substances that studies have shown do cause cancer in humans. They've used humans and animals in the research. They know these things cause cancer. Okay, group 2A, you'll see that beef is on there, red meat, including pork and lamb also, um, probably carcinogenic to humans, along with emissions from high temperatures, frying, and then exposures to chemicals when you work in a beauty salon. Okay, they're saying that these things probably cause cancer. Now what people failed to look at when they saw this graphic was they categorized, they put items in a category based on how likely they are to cause cancer, but they did not differentiate between the items in each category on how likely they are. So basically, people took it as bacon will cause cancer just as much as smoking will. The risk is equal. Or beef is probably going to cause cancer as much as emissions from high temperatures. So the risk was perceived as equal in each category. Does that make sense? Okay. But the bottom line is we need to take this graphic and put risk into perspective, okay? Items that are labeled as carcinogenic to humans that will cause cancer include smoking, alcohol, processed meats, and exposure to radiation. When all actuality, 34,000 cancer deaths per year can be attributed to a high consumption of processed meat. That's a high number. We'd like it to be zero. So we need to take a look at our intake of processed meat. But 600,000 deaths per year can be attributed to alcohol intake and a million deaths per year can be attributed to smoking. So the risk was not equal and that's how things kind of got blown out of perspective. 
that if you were actually to read the whole report from the World Health Organization and not just look at that graphic, you would see that the report stated multiple times that red meat does not cause cancer. It also pointed out that there wasn't enough evidence to even recommend a, an amount of beef that should be consumed every day. And that you couldn't tie cancer risk to one type of red meat over another. So the American Institute for Cancer Research, two separate entities from the IACR versus the AICR, it's confusing. Um, the American Institute for Cancer Research recommends avoiding processed meat as much as you can and limiting your consumption of red meat to 18 ounces per week, which to a dietitian takes the stance of moderation, which is what I promote. You're not eating red meat every day. It's in a moderate amount, and hopefully you're choosing lean cuts, okay? And they also stated that just as important as the type of meat you're eating, you gotta pay attention to how active you are. Are you exercising? Because that has a great tie to cancer risk. And are you maintaining a healthy body weight? So we've got to look at the whole picture and avoid um, fear mongering, inducing fear in consumers. We've got to fight fear with facts, okay? Because alarming messages are what attack, attract attention and create buzz. And but most of these claims don't look at the whole picture in the scientific evidence. And people are quick to blame one thing on their health problems. They blame their health problems on one item and they don't look at what they're doing as a whole to achieve optimal health. So we wanna uh, shift our focus from eliminating things to more of an inclusive approach. All foods can fit into a healthy diet, but you're looking at the way you're preparing your foods the type of food you're choosing, how often you're eating it, okay? Any questions about that? Well, I do have a question. I think it kind of ties in with that. What is your definition of a processed meat? Because I know people think, mm -hmm. you know, people have different definitions of that, I guess, and so what do you consider, I mean, what do you consider processed meat? I consider a processed meat to be anything that has been smoked, cured, had chemical nitrates, nitrites added to it, any additives or preservatives. An unprocessed meat would be meat that is fresh and raw and hasn't had anything done to it. Now a rotisserie chicken, for example, that you buy at the store, they've cooked a raw chicken, that's fine, but nothing's been added to a rotisserie chicken to preserve it in any way mm -hmm. or to make it shelf stable. So processed meats would include things like cured and smoked bacon, lunch meats, Italian cold cuts like salami, pepperoni. Um, they've been processed and had additives, preservatives, smoked, curing. Does that make sense? What about burger? A burger? Like ground beef. Ground beef. They're not adding anything to it. I mean, it's raw meat that's just been ground. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's true. So. No. They can't. No. They can't. They can't. Okay. Not fresh ground beef. Well, or even roast or chicken or whatever they're wrapping up and putting out for us to buy. Do they ever put anything if on there? If it's fresh meat, they have to label it if they've added something. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, the USDA would require them to label. So it could be a label on there. It could be a small label. And you might not even yeah. pay any attention. You just, I mean, we have our own beef, but. Not has that. Yeah, you've got to read the labels and just ask if you're not sure. But if it's ground in house, if it's just pure. So most of the stuff, like when you go to a store and, and they cut your meat for you, your lunch meat, your ham, turkey, whatever, in the deli. Mm -hmm. Is that processed? Is yes, it is processed? because of the way it's been prepared. Like it, you look at a what they're shaving it off a deli turkey breast. That's like the size of a backpack. It's a, it's a lot bigger than a turkey vest. It is processed. It's had things added to it. It's been cured. It's probably been smoked. You, you can know. You ask to see the label. Yeah. What they're, they're shaving. You can say, can I see the label? Mm -hmm. and, I mean, 
there is a label there that didn't cross that. Mm -hmm. okay. What about that pink stuff in the hamburger? Mm -hmm. The pink slime. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna let you take that one, Mark. Sure. Mark, Mark is a lot more. Yeah. So, uh, lean, finely textured beef. L F P D. You know, there's an acronym for everything, right? Mm -hmm. But the media, they really coined it as what? Pink slime. slime. Who wants yeah. to eat slime? <laughs> that sounds horrible, doesn't it? Yeah. You know what it, you know what LFTB is? 100% beef. 100% beef. There we go. Now, and so when in the big processing plants, they have to make everything as profitable as they can, right? They need to get as much margin as they can in these processing plants. So when they're deboning things and they're trying to move things through the processing plant, it's a way they can they can strip all the muscle fibers away from the bone tissue and and they do that in order to get more value off of that carcass so in order to get all that and then they they grind it very very fine you could grind ground beef to a point where it looks like pink slime you really could yeah. and so that adds back and so consumers were you know in my mind were misled in that the process that they do is they use ammonia sometimes to get that to drop off of there, but it's 100% beef. And so there was this big uproar and a lot of people in the retail thing said, no more LFTB, right? We're not putting it in. I can tell you that it's in there, unless somebody continues to, to want that, but it's 100% safe but our media did a very good job of putting some of that fear yeah. mongering that she talked about a while ago into our ideas, but it's 100% beef. That help? Good, good, good. Thanks, Mark. I knew he could describe that a little more eloquently because he's <laughs> seen the actual process, seen it done. So next I'd like to talk about beef as a high quality fuel for building lean body mass. And this is something I talk about a lot in my own household because my husband's an exercise physiologist and works with athletes. And so he's always harping on me about getting adequate protein and high quality protein. So the Protein Summit 2.0 was a study done in the past five years where they brought over 60 nutrition experts, scientists, doctors, nutrition educators together to examine a huge body of research related to protein. And they wanted to look at the evidence and see what the impact of high quality protein was on optimal health. So right now the RDA, the recommended allowance, daily allowance for protein is 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Okay, that's the current recommended amount. And the RDA is based on the minimum amount required to prevent deficiencies. Okay, not necessarily to promote optimal health benefits. So they wanted to look at the body of evidence and see if the amount of protein we need to eat needs to go beyond the RDA to promote maximum health benefits, such as immune support, optimal synthesis of muscle tissue, and that's what we'll talk about more in detail. So the evidence that they looked at showed that we need to look at high quality protein in the context of several different health factors. We need to look at high quality protein in the context of weight management and satiety. Does a higher protein diet help people manage their weight better? Does it help them feel more full and satisfied between one meal and the next? We also need to look at protein intake in its role with maintaining muscle mass as we age and preventing loss of muscle mass, which is sarcopenia. We also need to look at protein intake on bone health. Does higher protein intake um, support better turnover in our bones? And then what types of protein are the highest quality protein to provide those optimal health benefits? So they reviewed the research and all of those air, uh, first we'll talk about the weight management and satiety. Okay, they showed that 
higher protein intake contributed to overall more satisfaction from one meal to the next and a better ability to control weight, especially once someone had lost weight. Higher protein intakes helped them maintain that weight loss. So with weight management and satiety, they found that protein intakes of 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram were most effective. Intakes this high also helped increase thermogenesis. That refers to metabolism. It takes a lot more calories to burn protein than it does fat. Okay, so in theory, if you eat more protein, your body's gonna burn more calories, breaking that down than with a high fat or a high carb diet. It helps people to increase and maintain their lean body mass. Lean body mass is basically muscle tissue. It's very highly metabolic tissue. It burns more calories than fat mass does. That's why, uh, as a dietitian, I believe lean body mass is a better indicator of overall health than weight, because weight is just a number. Someone who has a very high lean body mass would be considered obese. If you were to look at their BMI, which takes into account their height and weight, they'd be considered obese because muscle weighs so much. But actually, they have a very high lean body mass, which is very metabolically active and burns a lot of calories. So we need to look at lean body mass overweight. It also showed that higher protein intake improved glycemic control, so it helped keep blood sugar more stable throughout the day. Um, this is really important to look at with diabetics as well. And a higher protein intake limited weight that you regained after loss. Protein with regards to muscle maintenance and sarcopenia prevention, they showed that um, to maintain your muscle mass and prevent loss of muscle mass as you age, it's recommended that you get one to 1.2 grams of protein per day. Um, and just a four ounce serving of a high quality protein at each meal can increase your muscle protein synthesis by as much as 50% without even exercising. So spacing it out throughout the day at each meal. And we'll talk more about that. Um, sarcopenia, like I said, is the progressive loss of muscle mass with age. If this happens, it's associated with a three to four times increase in the likelihood of someone having to file for disability. So loss of muscle mass in the elderly is a huge health concern that we need to look more at and how optimal protein intake can prevent that. Protein and bone health. So there's, for a long time, there's been a widely held belief that a higher protein intake can harm bone health, but recent studies in the past have found the opposite to be true, that increasing high quality protein in your diet can actually correlate with increased bone mineral content and decreased risk of fractures. But what's important with that is you need to have an optimal intake of protein and calcium to get the benefit. You can't have a high protein intake and a low calcium intake and receive that benefit. Both need to be adequate. Um, and optimal protein intake for bone health is likely higher than the current recommendations of 0 0.8 grams per kilogram, especially for the elderly. So what is a high quality protein? Anyone have a guess? But what makes meat a high quality protein? Lean, yes, exactly, essential amino acids. So amino acids are basically what protein is made out of. If you were gonna break down protein and look at it at the microscopic level, the building box blocks of protein are amino acids. Okay, and science has found 20 different amino acids. Some of these amino acids are non-essential, meaning our body makes them on its own. But some of the amino acids are what we call essential amino acids. We do not produce them in our body, so we need to get them from our diets, okay? And the reason meat is a high quality protein is because it contains all 20 of those amino acids. But that's also true of any animal protein. So dairy and eggs are complete proteins. They contain all the amino acids. Um, some plant-based proteins that are complete. Anyone have a guess? Like a whole grain and a bean. Some
some of them, yeah. Plant, plant proteins generally are incomplete proteins. They don't contain all of the amino acids. However, there are two that are complete. Soy protein contains all the amino acids and quinoa, which is actually a seed. So quinoa and soy are complete proteins. Those would be considered high quality. But something else that makes beef, meat, and animal proteins even higher quality is the fact that the iron they contain is more easily absorbed in our bodies, okay? Plant proteins that have iron sometimes have inhibiting factors in the plant compound that can prevent iron from being absorbed as efficiently. That's called non-heme iron. That's a plant-based iron. Heme iron is the iron found in plant proteins, and it's much more readily available to be absorbed and utilized by our body. So that's what makes something a high quality protein. It's lean, the iron is readily available and absorbed, and it contains all the amino acids, okay? I was gonna ask you, the protein that was used in this study, Mm -hmm. was it a combination of animal and plant proteins, or was it all animal or? That's a good question. They reviewed so many different studies, like meta-analysis and compilations of a lot of studies, and then, broke all of that down with relation to the different disease states or health concerns that they didn't specify types of proteins, but the, they did specify that high quality protein, they in, emphasized one to 1.2 grams of high quality protein was what you needed to achieve those optimal health benefits. Does that make sense? Yes. So let's play a little game. In all of the research, they showed that it was most beneficial to space your protein intake out throughout the day. Okay, so me, for example, I may need, if I'm gonna follow that one to 1.2 grams per kilogram, I'm trying to aim for 60 to 70 grams of protein per day. Do I wanna eat all of that in one meal to achieve the best health benefits? No, they found that muscle, muscle tissue synthesis is optimized when you space your protein intake throughout the day. So aiming for 20 to 30 grams at every meal. Okay, so 25 grams is what you're looking at at a meal. Let's look at some plant-based sources of protein first. How much peanut butter do you think you would need to eat at a meal to get that 25 grams of protein? Ten tablespoons. At least nine. The answer is seven. You would have to eat seven tablespoons of peanut butter at your breakfast on your toes <laughs> to get that 25 grams That's of protein. <laughs> and you're exchanging, you're, you're getting 670 calories in that peanut butter to achieve optimal intake at breakfast. That's a lot. And from a weight maintenance perspective or weight loss, that's not going to work. It's not going to cut it to get all your protein from peanut butter. Black beans, one and a half cups of black beans you would need to eat for 374 calories to get 25 grams of protein. Now that's the equivalent of a whole 14.5 ounce can of black beans. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to eat a whole can of black beans (laughs) for my lunch or any kind of bean. Maybe half a cup, but that's, that's too much. Raw tofu, one and a quarter cups of raw tofu for 25 grams of protein, 236 calories. How much lean beef do you think you need to eat at a meal for that 25 grams? Three ounces. ounces. That's the size of the palm of your hand or a computer mouse or a deck of cards. That's about three ounces. Now granted, three ounces of any meat, whether it be a chicken breast or a salmon filet or tilapia or a can of tuna, three ounces of any of those would provide 25 grams of protein. They're high quality, okay? A cup of Greek yogurt, probably 12 grams, 12 to 15, depending on the brand. And if you buy low fat, that could keep your calories in check. But we've got to look at the different types of protein and realize that they're not all created equal, okay? (laughs) And, and think about that from a weight maintenance perspective. 
So when I was looking at all of that research in the Protein Summit 2.0, I was like, this is a lot to digest. I need to condense it into something that's easy for me to remember that can, I can share with my clients. So I developed this acrostic, and you'll see it spells out the word protein. Okay, P is for power, R for recovery, O for optimal intake, T for type of protein, E for even distribution, I for intuitive eating, and N for nourish. We'll just go through those real quick, but already we know protein is powerful. It supports a strong lean body, higher lean body mass. It helps optimally synthesize muscle tissue, increase immune support, control your appetite. Recovery. Individuals who are very active, they exercise a lot, or maybe their immune systems are compromised, or they're training for a marathon or something like that. They need higher protein intakes to promote the resynthesis of muscle tissue that's been damaged in activity. So higher protein intake helps with recovery and it also uh, helps reduce muscle mass that's lost as we age. Optimal intake. We need to move our recommendation from 15 to 20% of total calories coming from protein, more up to around 30% of total calories coming from lean, high quality protein. Um, and the current recommendation, like I said, is 0 0.8 grams per kilogram, but we're seeing that those optimal health benefits can be achieved with a higher intake of 1 to 1.5, okay? Type, we talked about that. Protein sources should be lean. Think about the iron being readily available to absorb and does your protein contain all the amino acids. Even distribution, when you relate that to someone, say space your protein and take out throughout the day, 25 to 30 grams at a meal. Intuitive eating, how many of you have heard of this term? Anyone know what it means? It basically refers to, to paying attention to your hunger cues to relate when you're gonna eat. Eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full and it encourages people to get back to that point where they can really recognize fullness and stop eating knowing that if they're hungry two or three hours later they can have a snack that will sustain them through dinner. And I've seen this myself. Um, when I aim for that 25 grams of protein at a meal, I feel full and satisfied longer for three or four hours then I'm not tempted to overeat when I get to my next meal because I'm so hard hungry I grab anything that's in sight. And then nourish. This N is for nourish and that goes back to the 10-10-10 rule. You can get over 10% 10 per, 10 of the daily value for 10 different nutrients in three ounces of lean beef. So the 30-day protein challenge was a fun uh, accountability tool developed by the Beef Council. Has anyone heard of that 30-day protein challenge? You can access this on beefnutrition.org, but basically it's a 30-day challenge to encourage you to get 25 to 30 grams of protein in at every meal. And it provides a calendar and a journal for you. And the 30 days are broken up into different activities, okay? So on days that you journal, you will write down everything you eat, and estimate the amount of protein in it. And you'll also write down kind of about your mood and your satisfaction and hunger level. So how did I feel after I ate this meal? Was I satisfied? Was I hungry two hours later? Did I feel like I was able to focus more throughout the day? So the journaling, you're really getting nitty gritty about what you're eating, your mood, how satisfied you are. The review days are for when you go back at that food journal and look and identify trends and patterns. Okay, so the, this, this high protein meal helped me feel fuller, or if I didn't eat any protein at breakfast, if I just had a cup of coffee, did I overeat at lunch because I was so hungry? So the review is you're looking for trends and patterns. The rest days just allow you to eat as you normally would. Whatever you feel like, maybe it's a weekend day that you use for your rest day, and then it allows you to plan to get that higher protein intake on later days. Protein shift days 
are when you look for meals and determine whether or not they're adequate, whether or not they reach the 25 to 30 grams. And then the protein balance days are actually where you're trying to get that 25 to 30 grams in. So if you'd like to try getting a higher protein intake, high quality protein, this will be a fun thing to do in the new year. I'm going to do it in January and blog about my experience because how many of you can guess, what do you think the hardest meal for the typical American is to get enough protein in? Breakfast. Breakfast. Yes, this is so challenging for me because I crave carbs at breakfast. Like, I'll be content with a bowl of oatmeal or a whole wheat English muffin with maybe a little peanut butter, but not six tablespoons of peanut butter. And I don't get enough protein in at breakfast. I don't like eggs. I'm not a big fan of yogurt. I don't like to drink milk. So this is really hard for me. And they're finding with, finding with people that have done the 30-day protein challenge that breakfast is the hardest meal to achieve compliance and that a lot of people just don't know what a high-quality protein is. But cottage cheese would count or soybeans, edamame, those would be a great thing to add to lunch or doing an omelet, so. Yeah, walnuts and almonds are a complete protein and they're high in fiber. They're just also high in calories, so you've gotta watch the amount. But that would be a good way to reach that 25 to 30 grams. Cheese is somewhat high in protein, but it's also really high in fat. If you're choosing a low fat cheese, like a Heart skim string cheese may have about seven grams of protein. Um, so you can use little things like that to get to the total. You're probably just going to have to eat more food, like a string cheese and a tablespoon of peanut butter and an egg and a whole grain piece of toast with a lot of protein. What about the protein shakes? Protein shakes would be a really easy, good way because a scoop of whey protein powder probably has about 20 grams of protein, it's a complete protein, so it has all the amino acids, and if you mix it with skim milk, even better. Because you can add it to sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. You add it to sweet potatoes, you add the white eggs, like four white eggs only, yeah. you mix it, and you can make like pancakes. Yes. And you do your breakfast, and you don't add any grains. You're right. So you can like, try to change your breakfast and have high protein. You're right, that's a really great suggestion. She's. So how many, how many of you have seen those grain-free pancakes online, recipes with just like bananas and gluten-free oats and protein powder? She's saying you could make a sweet potato pancake mixing sweet potato with egg whites and protein powder to make a high-protein pancake. So there really is a lot of opportunity for foodies and people with culinary interests to get creative and develop higher protein recipes using egg whites and protein powder. That's great. So looking to the future, what, what do we need to do? So obviously when you look at the American Institute for Cancer Research and the World Health Organization report, they, they can't recommend an optimal intake of red meat or protein yet. So more research still needs to be done, but we are seeing that you can achieve a lot of really great health benefits from a protein intake that's higher than the RDA of 0 0.8 to 1. Um, and what we didn't talk about also was protein and its effect on the kidneys. Well, the studies have shown that you can double your intake. You can have up to two grams of protein per kilogram without any harmful effect to your kidneys is what the current recommendation on that is. Um, and then we need more research to determine actual intake recommendations for those different disease states and health factors. So an intake for people who are aging, how much do senior adults really need to have, and so forth. And then we need to look more at the relationship of protein intake and how it's distributed over the day. That needs to be studied more, and then we need different research evaluating the effectiveness of those specific protein sources. So soy being a complete protein and its effects versus an egg, for example, or an animal protein. <coughs> So the bottom line to summarize anything is we just need to find balance, try and achieve balance and not, rec not recommend or rely on one food or over the exclusion of others to solve all your health problems, okay? Let, let, your, let facts influence your decision over fear. If you hear something crazy in the media, 
find the facts, go find the evidence, see did they look at the whole picture when they reported this. Um, focus on inclusion of all foods in a balanced way then excluding certain things and thinking that will solve all of your problems. And my perspective as a dietitian is just to promote the consumption of beef or any animal protein as the embellishment to a meal and not the starring role. Because in the American diet, we want to see a big hunk of meat and two sides and that's our dinner. <laughs> but meat as the embellishment helps people accept three to 3.5 ounces as an appropriate amount. So 3.5 ounces of beef on a nice salad that's plant-based with lots of vegetables and grains or in a nice hearty stew with quinoa or farro and lots of color in it, okay? Focus, shift your focus from beef as the starring roll or meat as the starring roll to the embellishment and that will help you accept that smaller portion size of three to three and a half ounces. So a lot of resource, resources I've mentioned throughout the day. Um, if you're a Twitter fan, you can tweet the beef RD on Twitter at beef RD with any questions you have or comments and she's always really great at responding in a timely manner with science and facts. Um, Beefnutrition.org is where you can read all the studies I've mentioned today in their entirety and also download a lot of really great fact sheets and graphics that are great for sharing with friends and family members and then the Heart Healthy Beef Cookbook, some great recipes for that. And then the interactive butcher counter at beefitswhatsfordinner.com will help you become confident in cooking lean beef. So that's all I have for you today. Do you have any more questions for me?